Good morning. I call to order the County of Placer Board of Supervisors meeting for Tuesday, May 8th, 2012 at 9 a.m. We will begin this morning with the flag salute led by me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, we will have the statement of meeting procedures read by our clerk, Ann Holman. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, May 8, 2012. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There's a three-minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such, and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has the discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that all pagers or cell phones be either turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> Bless you, Holly. Excuse me. <laughs> Now is the time for public comment. Um, anyone may address the board on items not on today's agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes, since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all the public comment cannot be heard within 15 minutes, we will take it up again at the end of the regular session and understand that the board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Diane Friedberg and I live at 12660 Lakeshore North in Auburn. I am here today because I hope you noticed that in your halls here at the domes is artwork. And I hope you have spring fever because that is the theme of the artwork. I am chairperson for the Placer Artists League, which is a program of Placer Arts. PAL is a group of active visual artists who meet regularly for camaraderie, artist presentations, paint outs, demonstrations on a variety of media and art related topics from award winning professionals within the area of Placer County. Our charter is to support and educate local artists, encourage emerging artists, and provide opportunities for displaying and the sale of members' work. The artists range from novices to professionals working within a variety of 2D and 3D media. We date back to 1958, and we now thrive as a program of Placer Arts. And we provide resources to support the Council's many fine arts programs and extending its reach to include a wide variety of fine artists in our county. Our membership is growing, and we currently have 90 members, of which we're very proud of. Our biggest fundraiser of the year is our annual fine arts competition or our PAL Open Jury Show. This show draws artists from across the county and other counties and is open to all artists. This year we are excited because the show <clears throat> will take place at the Bernhard Winery. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for making this Bernhard Winery available for our annual fun event. We invite you to stop by the gallery to visit us during the show that takes place June 19th through July 6th. Thank you. Thank you. And wonderful art out there, Diane. Absolutely beautiful. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward under public comment and um, raise any issue that is not on today's agenda? All right, seeing none, I will close public comment and we will move on to supervisor's committee reports. I see no supervisor committee reports. We will then move to our consent agenda. 
All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the County Executive Department. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. And anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action, and that item may be moved for discussion. Is there anyone who would like to move anything off the consent agenda today for discussion? Seeing none. Okay. This will be a roll call vote. Holmes. Aye. Duran. Yes. Why can't? Yes. Euler. Aye. Montgomery. Yes. All right. <clears throat> We will move to our first department item at this time. This will be art item number five, administrative services, procurement. And Brett Wood will be presenting. Good morning, Chairwoman. Good morning. Supervisors. Brett Wood with the procurement division. I'm here today with item 5A which is a sole source, a request to renew a sole source agreement with Megabyte. Um, this product has been used by Placer County since 1995 for the use of three different departments and is currently being managed by the IT division. It is also being represented today with Kathy Buchanan, the Deputy Director of IT. Um, our current agreement with Megabyte will expire on June 30th of this year and they are the only provider that can provide the maintenance and services necessary for this product. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. We also have representatives from the departments if there are additional questions. Supervisor Holmes. Is it Kathy with a C? With a K. With a K, thanks. I, 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 I thought I was on car talk for a minute there. <laughs> Supervisor Duran. Yes, uh, thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, the 3.5% uh, uh, increase, is that just the cost of doing business or is there anything different with the contract? No, sir, that's the general, it's a consumer price index for last year. We've, we try and tie our software contracts down to this type of uh, increase. We try and tie them to the consumer price index or something similar so we can measure that increase on a repetitive basis so that we don't get hit with a 15 or 18 percent increase. Thank you very much. Okay, I see no other questions here. Um, Brett and Kathy, thank you for bringing this forward. And Brett, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for all the work you've also done, um, particularly in aid to some folks up in Forest Hill. So thank you. What's the uh, pleasure of the board? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. We will now move on to Department Item 6 uh, through the Board of Supervisors. This is approving a proclamation declaring the week of May 20th to 26, 2012 as National Public Works Week. Ken Graham presenting. Hi. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Board. Ken Graham with the Department of Public Works. Uh, today we're asking you to approve a proclamation declaring the week of May 20th to 26th as National Public Works Week. Uh, every May, jurisdiction around the country celebrate the third week in May as National Public Works Week. And it's re really to recognize all those people and all the infrastructure we have and the people who provide those services every day. This year, the American Public Works Association and their 28,000 members have created their or selected the theme of public works creating a lasting impression. And so we have hundreds of employees in the Department of Public Works and Facility Services who are providing a wide range of services, transportation, wastewater, uh, facilities, and flood control. So I hope you can join me in celebrating our county employees providing infrastructure and services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making sure people can turn on the tap knowing they're drinking safe water, they can flush the toilet knowing that that water is going to be taken away and addressed appropriately, or driving down our roads and making, knowing that they can do so safely if they obey all the traffic laws. And so with that, happy to, to uh, provide this proclamation and ask for your board's uh, approval of it. Any questions or comments from the board? Supervisor Holmes. Uh, hey, you can uh, appreciate all the hard work you do, and uh, your department has always been receptive to any uh, issues that I have, and you address them quickly and uh, properly, and I appreciate that. So I just want to let you know that every day for Placer County and Supervisor Holmes is Public Works Day. <laughs> there we go. Appreciate that. <laughs> 
I, I uh, would like to echo Supervisor Holmes' words. I think your um, department is incredibly well run and the work that you do that really is work that protects our community. I, I don't think people understand how much of what you do is really about protecting the community and making sure that we're safe, whether it's driving on the roads, going over bridges, or as you say, appropriately um, having wastewater move away. Um, but um, is there anything in particular that you'd like to point out? I, I think the Forest Hill Bridge work has been pretty amazing, um, but there's things in other districts that have also been projects that are just phenomenal, and now's the time for you to kind of Celebrate sing your own those. praises a little bit. <laughs> well, we, we are very fortunate, whether on the project end, our, our, our bridges countywide, we're beginning a, a new construction of a new bridge over on Cook Riolo Road in the Dry Creek area. We have a couple of bridges that will, your board will be looking to approve a, a construction contract in the west area on Brewer Road, uh, west of Lincoln. Uh, not to mention our Forest Hill Bridge, all the wide range of environmental improvement projects that we've been doing up in the Tahoe area. We're, we're still very proud of how on Lake Forest we restored the stream, bringing uh, kokanee salmon back upstream into Lake Forest, a very big uh, success for us. We're looking forward also to restoring Snow Creek, which we got uh, several million dollars to buy a, set, a piece of property. We're cleaning it up uh, to bring back the natural ecosystem up there at Snow Creek on the north shore of, of Lake Tahoe. But it's not just about the projects, it's about the people who do the work each and every day. Just the simple things, whether it's filling the potholes, whether it's driving the buses, keeping our vehicles uh, up and operating, uh, we can't do it without each and every one of them. We're very fortunate to have, and you're very fortunate to have, just a, a group of people that really do their best each and every day for our citizens. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, any members of the public want to uh, make any comments on this? All right, seeing none, um, what's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you so much for all your great work. All right, we will move to item seven, Community Development Resource Agency, Sheridan General Plan Update Opportunities slash work program. And Jennifer, you have a new last name and you're going to have to pronounce it for us. It's Bias. Bias. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer Bias here for the planning division to present this item, the Sheraton Community Plan Update Work Program. And I put together a real quick brief PowerPoint to go over with you. Um, a little bit of background, why we're doing this community plan update. The Sheraton Community Plan is the second oldest community plan within the county. It was adopted in 1976, and census data that was used was 1970. So some of that data is out, pretty outdated, and over the last 30 years, and there's been quite a bit of change in West Placer, and in particular around the surrounding communities of Sheraton. Um, the update will provide the plan with more accurate reflection of regional growth and resource protection. It'll also update state planning laws, local ordinance, and provide guidance for the community decision makers. There's also some new opportunities to explore out in Sheraton with the 65 bypass, where the connection will be, and also with some upgrades that have recently been completed to the wastewater and water treatment plants out there. The existing community plan is 1,710 acres or 2.67 miles. Um, the population, according to the 2010 census, is 746 people. Um, there's eight community plan designations. This is the current footprint of the community plan, most of which you will see is um, rural, large rural residential, but there's also some commercial and multifamily designations industrial also. Um, the work program options that we're here to present to you, um, and we have basic, two basic questions, which is should we proceed with the work program as well as which options should we follow? Um, the first option, 1A, is to proceed with the community plan update using the existing community plan boundaries, and we would look at potential land use changes within the current footprint of the plan. The second option, which is option 1A, would be to proceed with the update looking at a modified boundary. And that modified boundary um, could include land use changes. 
And then option 1C is, again, uh, proceed with the update looking at a modified boundary and including a fairgrounds relocation option. And the fairgrounds relocation alternative is just that. It's an alternative. It's an opportunity for the community and the county and the planning division to explore this particular option. And it would in no way commit the county to moving the fairgrounds out to a Sheraton location. This is just a particular alternative that the county staff and the community could look at and make a recommendation to the board. Um, the costs for 1A and 1B are for 150 to 250,000 for EIR, and that would be projected for the next fiscal year. And then the costs are, are the same for option 1C, but we would be potentially looking at additional funds to uh, fund a feasibility study for the fairgrounds relocation. And there's also an additional policy, uh, option, which is option two, and that's only to update the community plan and only look at policy changes. No land use changes would be considered under that option. That's one of the options that we recently did with the Granite Bay update, and we've also previously done in Meta Vista. And the cost for that would just be covering staff time. <clears throat> The community plan program um, has seven phases. There was a draft that was provided for discussion purposes in your staff report. Um, and this is the projected time frame, two-year program. So we would hopefully be back with an adoption in 2014 to the board. Um, next step is getting direction from you and likely a second visit with a final work program and final direction with the budget. And then we'll begin or continue our information gathering phases, work with the community, the MAC, to form a subcommittee, and look at developing planning documents. So with that, I'm going to wrap up with my conclusion. And we're here to hear your input and get a recommendation on this item. Any questions from the board on this? Supervisor Wigand. Some additional comments. Uh, really, a lot of this started with uh, the fact that we had to up grade the wastewater system to comply with the regulation, which provided an opportunity to add some incremental capacity to, to Sheridan, not with the vision of it doubling or tripling in size, but any in incremental investment up there, new housing construction or renovations uh, are, are a huge improvement uh, and an opportunity. In addition to that, uh, Highway 65 bypass uh, should be complete this next fall and the impact on the community for some different opportunities up there, perhaps commercial of some sort on the west side of town, uh, just creates for us an opportunity to relook at a very old community plan. Uh, by the way, historically, it's the oldest MAC in all of the county because we provide sewer and water out there. So, uh, so with that, I just huge thanks to Cedra staff for the work that they've put into us and facility services for the the results that we have with the opportunity for something like 100 new uh, potential EDU hookups with sewer and water. So uh, with that, really just wanted to give you that background. Thank you. Supervisor Duran. Yes. Um, on option number C, uh, what would be the cost? Actually, two questions. What would be the cost of the feasibility study? And when you uh, say relocate the fairgrounds, what exactly do you mean? You want to cover that, Lauren? Yeah, th there's no firm estimate yet in terms of the feasibility study, and that's an item that we would bring back to the board if the board selected that option. That was our recommendation, is that today is exploratory to get general direction and then come back to the board. Nevertheless, it was an estimate of around $100,000. The focus of the study is really on environmental and infrastructure constraints and less so on the financial feasibility. Uh, the scope of a fairgrounds uh, relocation we would certainly look to the work that was done in the mid-1990s and bring that information forward, make it more contemporary, make it consistent with the board's objectives today. Um, but I think that is a second dialogue that we would need to have with the board before we went and proceeded with that. The, the basic goal here is we had looked at Sunset one time in the past, in 1997. In fact, there's a designation in that area plan for a potential fairgrounds relocation. If in West Placer we're doing another community plan update and there appears to be at least the opportunity to examine the feasibility, 
with the Sheridan Community Plan, we wanted to certainly bring that to the attention of the board as to whether or not that's possible. But I think we'd like to refine that information and bring it back to the board before we actually acted on it. Thank you for clarifying that. Madam Chair, if I may. Please. Jim Durfee with Facility Services. Uh, relocation of the fairgrounds ultimately is, a, is a, a broad decision. A lot of different moving pieces to that, including the economic viability of the fairgrounds, the compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods and so forth. I think that the, uh, to add on to what Lauren said, the intent here is simply to evaluate from an environmental standpoint the, the feasibility of locating a fairgrounds, that type of an operation within this community plan area. Um, it could potentially end up with zoning that would allow that, and that's as far as this particular effort would go. The actual relocation of a fairground is a much broader, uh, much more complex discussion than simply the environmental review. And in terms of some additional detail, the, the cost effectiveness of the sewer and water enhancements are most likely to need to stay on the east side of the highway up there. I mean, we could take them across the road, uh, but the cost effectiveness <coughs> may be prohibited, so that would all have an impact on this decision. But it's the kind of work I think we need to take a look at and review and see what options and what desires the board might have. I see no other questions, so I have a couple myself. Um, first, I wanted to say I think just generally the idea of um, moving this item forward um, and, and looking at updating it ties in very much with some of the things that you've talked about, the upgrading of the sewer system, um, the Safe Routes to School project that we put in last year, I believe it was. Um, you know, Clearly, we've made a commitment to the Sheridan area, and I think this will just reaffirm the commitment that they're a valued part of the community. Um, as relates to uh, looking at the potential for cost sharing on relocating the fairgrounds, we talk about stakeholders and other interested parties. Who, who specifically would we be looking to to help share that cost? We, we certainly are interested in anybody who has the greatest interest, and obviously one of those parties might be the city of Roseville. That, is, that certainly is one option that we would consider. Um, in, in terms of other stakeholders out there, I, I don't know that I could even come up with a list other than the folks who are involved in fairground operations today, such as the Fair Association. Obviously, their participation would be essential. Um, but, but clearly, in terms of financial partnerships and looking to another jurisdiction who has the greatest to gain from that relationship with the county and a feasibility study would certainly be the city of Roseville. Okay. And then have conversations been had? Obviously, it would be we would be moving the fairground out of one supervisorial district into another and have conversations been initiated with both those supervisors to see if that's something that they would support? Again, this is very preliminary. It was to get general direction from the board today as to whether or not that should be part of a Sheridan community plan update. If the answer to that is yes, then we have a lot more work to do in terms of scoping out that effort, understanding whether or not there is the possibility of cost share, and then developing more precisely a scope of work and cost. So not a great deal of conversation yet because we need that general direction first. Okay. All right. Thank you. I see no other questions from the board. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question or comment on this item? All right. Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Well, uh, um, I'm pointed towards item 1B or C pending the board's desire to consider the fairgrounds question. So if there's some strong opposition to that, um, I would strongly encourage you to do 1B. You know, I don't know what the opportunity actually is realistically, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, so if the board uh, is inclined that way, I, I could make a motion for 1C and we could see what the vote is. Uh, short of that, I would strongly encourage us to uh, go forward with 1B. Any other comments? Supervisor Duran? Sure. Um, being the District 1 supervisor and having this discussion, Robert, um, uh, I, would, I would support 1C. Um, I, I think it's something that we need to look at from a lot of different uh, directions. And um, uh, I know we haven't really talked about this uh, with Cedar at all, but uh, if the board has a stomach uh, for $100,000 uh, feasibility study on that, then uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd be in support of that. Well, uh, move uh, that we direct staff to proceed with a Sheridan Community Plan update 
regarding or with uh, focus on uh, alternative 1C? Uh, I have a question. Supervisor Holmes? Uh, how are we going to pay for the $100,000 feasibility study? Does anybody have an idea? So we, we would like to bring back a scope to refine that number. It's, it's an estimate of $100,000 today. We'd also like to report back to the board on the entirety of the scope of a Sheridan community plan update and costs. And we would also like to report back to the board whether or not there is the potential for cost share um, on that $100,000. If it is solely a cost borne by the county, then it would be a general fund cost. Okay. You okay with that? Yeah. Any other questions, clarifications? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Just a little bit before our first timed item, so we'll move to 7B, Placer County Conservation Plan, Planning Agreement Contract Amendments and Corresponding Budget Revision. Mr. Lauren Clark presenting. Good morning, Madam Chair. Again, members of the board, three actions for the board to consider today on the PCCP, somewhat administrative activities associated with the work program. The first is an amendment to a document we call the Natural Communities Conservation Plan Planning Agreement. Um, and the second is two actions related to amendment to contracts for three other consultants working on the PCCP. The planning agreement is a document that was signed by the board in 2001 with three of the agencies involved in the preparation of the PCCP, California Department of Fish and Game, NOAA Fisheries, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's drawn from a state statute which is intended to guide the development of natural communities conservation plans. It contains a number of program elements and, and agreement elements, including definition of the planning area, what are the regulatory goals of the work program, what is the planning process that you will go through, and how to address and deal with projects that come before this board um, in the city of Lincoln, in this case, during the development of the plan, otherwise known as interim projects. Uh, the agreement ran for 10 years. It came up for expiration last year. We've been in a dialogue with wildlife agencies, with the assistant of outside counsel for the past few months, and we're now prepared to bring back to the board that agreement today. We are requesting four additional years over the initial 10 years. Uh, no other amendment is really being made to the agreement other than this extension. As it relates to the contracts, uh, we have a number of consultants who are working on the preparation of the PCCP. Uh, three of the consultants have been spending a lot of time over the past couple of years working with staff in the ad hoc committee on the preparation of the first administrative draft document that went out last February and hopefully another administrative draft document, <coughs> excuse me, in the summer of 2012. Three of those consultants, uh, TRA Environmental, uh, w w who is doing the primary work associated with the preparation of the conservation strategy, would receive the largest amount of money via this contract amendment, $250,000. House Wrath Economics Group is the county's economist on this, associated with fiscal impact issues and financial issues, as well as population and economic forecasting. That's $25,000. And then lastly, Salix, previously known as North Fork Associates, is primarily working with us on deal issues dealing with habitat, primarily wetland habitat, and the preparation of documents associated with um, compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act. That, that sums up to $311,000. All of those funds will come to Placer County via a federal award, a Section 6 award, as they call it. Uh, we have a match obligation that we are already meeting with other encumbered contracts and other duties of the county, so there's no impact to the general fund in terms of this $311,000. There's an additional $39,000 that is not before the board today uh, that will be available to the county council's office to assist with uh, a cost associated with outside council resources law group. But the action today is for the three contractors as recommended in the staff report. So again, three actions. One is to amend the planning agreement to add additional four years. And then two actions, one amending three contracts, and the second to authorize the chair to sign a budget revision. And with that, I'll answer any questions of the board. Thank you. Supervisor Wigand. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, your light was on. Yeah. I see no questions from our board on this. Uh, anything from any member of the audience on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Oh, uh, this is a roll call. Mike Ant, yes. Duran, yes. Holmes, yes. Euler, Montgomery. Yes. Thank you. Okay. 
Good timing. At this point, we will move to our first timed item. This is our 9.30 a.m. item. Uh, this is a presentation of commendations. There are two on our agenda today. Uh, the first uh, from Supervisor Wygant, the second from Supervisor Holmes. So I will start with Supervisor Wygant. Okay, uh, that would have been a commendation to Fowler Nursery on their 100 year anniversary, but as they're not here to receive it, we will uh, defer that to a, a future meeting. Uh, so we will move directly to Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my distinct pleasure to present a commendation uh, recognizing Twin Peaks Orchard. And I see we have some representatives from Twin Peaks. Uh, if they could come forward, please. That's you, Carol. <laughs> oh. Just stand at the lectern, please. And the reason I called you up here is because I'm going to need your help pronouncing some of these names. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell me your last name? Iwasaki. Pardon? Iwasaki. Okay. And Enriquez. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to read this and then I'll bring it down to you. In the matter of a commendation recognizing Twin Peaks Orchard on their 100 year anniversary and receiving the 2012 Placer Grown Farmer of the Year Award. Whereas Twin Peaks or Orchard was established in 1912 by Yosha, this is where I need your help. Yosha. Pardon? Yosha Kiwa. Yosha and Tomeo. 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 Nakai, got that part right. <laughs> when the surrounding Placer County foothills were considered to be the fruit basket of the world, Twins Peak Orchard has for 100 years been family owned and operated by the Nakai family using the principles of sustainable farming. And whereas Twin Peaks Orchard is nestled in the foothills of Newcastle, that's District 3. <laughs> e easy now. <laughs> Where the rolling hills, hot days, and cool nights create fruit that is not only rich in sugar, but full of flavor. And whereas Twin Peaks Orchard uses sustainable farming as a holistic approach to growing in the most environmentally friendly manner and not only work their orchards, the fifth generation, fam generation of their family still lives and plays in them. And whereas Twin Peaks Orchard handpicked and packed premium, hand pick and packed premium tree fruit, tree ripe fruit nearly year round, starting in early May with sweet peaches and floral nectarines, ending the year with a unique mix of persimmons and citrus. And whereas Twin Peaks Orchard's on site commercial processing facility is where they produce jams, salsa, sauces, pies, and dried items using only the highest quality fruits and vegetables. And whereas Twin Peaks Orchard provides a gourmet fruit lover's dream, where wonderfully delicious aromatic tree ripened fruit is picked at its opti optimum maturity to pro provide a taste and visual sensation like no other. Now therefore be it resolved that the Placer County Board of Supervisors on May 8, 2012 would like to congratulate Twin Peaks Orchard on their 100 year anniversary and winning the prestigious Placer Grown 2012 Farmer of the Year Award. I'll bring that down. Thank you. And while we're waiting, I just want to let everybody know that uh, when uh, the, the Kai family came to Placer County, the Holmes family was here to welcome them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're still there. We're still working on it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you so much for coming today, and congratulations both on your 100th anniversary and your award as uh, Farmers of the Year. That's just fantastic. I know that our uh, public information officer did want to get some additional photos outside in front of the building, so um, you don't need to feel compelled to stay for the rest of the board meeting if you don't want to, but uh, please do gather outside and uh, we'll get some additional photos. Thank you. All right, we're a little bit short of our 1040, which is our next timed item, so we will move to um, Department Item 8, County Executive Indigent Defense Services. Becky Reagan presenting. Good morning, Supervisor Montgomery, members of the board. Becky Riggin from the County Executive Office. The item before you this morning is found on page 169 in your board packets and is a request for board approval and authorization for the Interim County Executive Officer to sign two-year contract extensions with the three law firms that are currently providing public defense services. I'd like to take a quick moment and just introduce the principals from the law firm that are in the audience this morning. Uh, Richard Chumo holds the primary contract. Mark Berg holds the first level conflict contract. And Tony Carbone and Tim Balcom um, together hold the second level conflict contract. And as your board is aware, in Placer County, these services have always been provided through a contract model. Over the years, the County Executive Office has worked closely with County Council's Office, with members of the Placer County Superior Court and directly with the contract providers to ensure that our contracts follow best practices as outlined by the American Bar Association and other professional organizations <clears throat> for promoting quality contract public defense programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of these best practices include awarding contracts on qualitative criteria rather than on a cost basis alone, conducting regular oversight and monitoring activities, uh, including contract provisions that allow for supplemental funding for extraordinary cases and ensuring that Defense Council's workload does not exceed national caseload standards. It remains the opinion of the County Executive Office that when these practices are adhered to, contracting with the public sector is the best way to assure constitutionally sound legal representation in the most cost-effective manner possible. Current contracts with these firms were established in July 2006 following a competitive request for proposals process with an interview panel consisting of county staff and court officials. The panel conducted a thorough evaluation process consistent with county procurement policies and the panel members agreed unanimously upon the final ranking and selection of these three firms. The 2006 contracts allowed for two extensions the first running from July 1, 2010 through June 30th of this year at a total cost of $12,078,000. The second extension before your board today and would run July 1, 2012 through June 30th, 2014 at a total cost of $12,186,000. This reflects a total net increase of $107,000 for both years across all three firms to cover costs related to liability and health insurance increases and technology replacement costs for the primary firm. This modest increase was achievable to, due to decline system-wide in caseloads over the past few years, most notably in misdemeanor cases and to a lesser extent in felonies. This has allowed staffing to remain flat or in the case of the primary firm has allowed for reducing a part-time contract attorney to handle family support cases and absorbing, absorbing the workload back into the office. This caseload decline has also allowed the primary firm to replace a vacant attorney position with a support services specialist who will assist with client placements and other needs as clients work their way through the criminal justice system. The funding details for both the current contract cycle and for the extension being considered today are summarized in Table 1 on page 171 in your packets. You will notice the funding can vary from the first to the second year with these contracts, and this occurs because we often agree to fund certain things, such as replacing technology that are one-time in nature, and then the, um, that drops off in the second year. So to summarize, your board is requested to authorize funding for each of the firms as follows. 
$9,012,000 for the primary um, services contract with Richard Chumo and Associates, $2,670,000 for the first level conflict services contract with the law offices of Mark Berg, and $503,000 for the second level conflict services contract with the law offices of Balcom and Carbone. Um, and I or any of the principals from the law firms would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the board on this item? Supervisor Duran? Yes, uh, Becky, thank you very much for bringing this forward. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm reading a contract back here, item number three, compensation for services. I know that these contracts are fixed, uh, one for $9 million, 12, one for $2 million, 670, 450, and another one for 503456. Um, the contract reads here, should attorney identify a need for additional funding due to a significant sustained increase in cases, um, it, it appears that there can be an increase. Well, what is the history on uh, any increases in the co on, on these particular contracts? Um, actually, we do track those costs, and we pay around, on average, two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 a year for those extraordinary services that the law firms do require. And uh, there's a process that where the judges review it and authorize it, and then we uh, we pay those those costs. So that is the safety valve or the relief valve to make sure that this is not a flat fee contract mechanism. And that is one of the essential approaches to make making sure that the attorneys have the resources they need to to do quality defense work. And just to clarify, that goes to the judges; they approve that, and then it goes to whom for approval. It goes to our, um, well, once we have the approval from the judges, that, that is the approval That's that the approval. is required. Okay. And then we, um, our fiscal team and the county executive office makes those payments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay. Uh, Becky, just to clarify, this is the second of the two two-year um, extensions That's allowed under the contract. Yes. So what will happen in two years? Well, we have, we, it is within our authority to extend the contracts again um, if we so chose to do that. We would work with the Superior Court again to, um, to make sure that they were comfortable with the contract and how things were working and we would have, your board would have the option to extend the contracts again if they so chose to. We may consider going out for an RFP um, process at, at that time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see no other questions from the board. Any questions or comments from any members of the audience on this item? Anyone from any of the firms here today want to make any comments on this? All right, seeing none from the audience, I'll bring it back to the board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll now move to our second timed item which is a Board of Supervisors presentation of commendation for Kitty Hollitz from Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm honored to present this uh, commendation to Kitty Hollitz, uh, who has just stepped down from the Older Adult Advisory Commission. And I, it's just a coincidence that I'm the older adult on this board. <laughs> uh, although I'll agree that sometimes I don't act like it. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> so I'm honored. I want to read this uh, respectfully. In the matter of a commendation honoring Kitty Hollitz for her dedication to her community and the difference she has made in the lives of the residents of Placer County. Whereas Kitty Hollitz has been a lifelong resident of Placer County where she has raised her children and taught countless numbers of other children during her career as a teacher. And whereas upon her retirement she continued her love of teaching and helping others through a variety of other means. Whereas <clears throat> Kitty was involved in the Placer County Older Adult Advisory Commission as well as the Area 4 Agency on Aging where she was part of the process to provide a voice for <clears throat> a voice in county government as it related to the creation and delivery of services promoting the well-being and quality of life for older adults. Whereas with Kitty's love of books and learning, it was only natural that she spent much time at the Auburn Library as the Director of Information and Referral Desk where she helped the public reach needed services such as legal, medical, dental, housing, and recreational opportunities. 
And whereas, while still at the Auburn Library, Kitty was responsible for developing the original plan for Placer Adult Liter Liter Literacy Service, PALS, to help adults become better readers and where she wrote grants to obtain funding from the state, from the California State Library. And whereas Kitty was on the committee at Sierra College that helped develop the Senior, Senior Emeritus Program, which enabled individuals 55 and older to attend enrichment classes at no cost to continue their lifelong learning. Now therefore, let it be known that on this day of May 8, 2012, the Placer County Board of Supervisors would like to commend Kitty Hollitz on her dedication to her community and the difference she has made in the lives of the residents of Placer County, young and old alike. Say a few words. Say a few. Okay. Just a few. And everybody looks back at the others. So okay. okay. I'll wait till you get there. Okay, good. Yeah. That is. Please go ahead. Hello, all of you. I came to many of your meetings in the past as I worked right across the street, as he said. It was a pleasure to hear what you were doing. I enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you so much. I wish I could come now, but I have to let that go by. Thank you again for this honor. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Kitty, for all your years. Madam Chair, we also have a presentation from the Area 4 Agency on uh, Aging. Uh, Deanna Lee and uh, Sue Dings uh, would like to present that to Kitty. Good morning, well. Madam Good Chair, morning. members of the board. Uh, thank you for this recognition for Kitty. She certainly well deserves it. Um, Kitty and I were talking just a few minutes ago, and, and I think I've known Kitty probably 30 or 40 years, so probably more than many of you have. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Kitty's been a member of our advisory council for years. She's been on our legislative committee, and uh, she's just been, she's always been there, and she's really cared about the citizens of uh, Placer County and our seven counties of Area 4. She was, as mentioned, the information and referral director uh, funded by the area agency, and she's just been a, a tremendous stabilizing force. And you know, it doesn't matter if she's happy or sad or disappointed. She is one of the most gracious ladies I think I've ever met. And she always maintains a, a nice smile. And, and thank you for allowing us to give her, uh, give her this uh, recognition from the Area Agency on Aging. It, I'll just read it. Um, it says, in recognition of many years of dedicated service and advocacy on behalf of older adults, Thank you for your valuable contributions to the Area 4 Agency on Aging as an advisory council member. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. And I believe, Mike, did you want some additional photos out front as well for this? Um, any, any any members or family friends of, of Kitty, if you could uh, just join out front there. Uh, I think Mike wants to take a few more photos. And thank you all for coming today. All right. At this time, we will move to 
Department item 8B, County Auditor Controller, consideration of appointment of County Auditor Controller to fill the unexpired term of the office being vacated. Holly Heinzen presenting. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, as you all know, the incumbent County Auditor Controller, Kathy Martinez, um, has submitted her resignation effective May 4th, which was Friday. And this creates a vacancy in the Auditor Controller's elected position. The Board of Supervisors has the authority to fill this vacancy. Historically, such appointments have occurred either as a promotional appointment from within the office or by a broader recruitment. The Placer County Charter sets forth the process for making this appointment. Under the Placer County Code, the Auditor Controller that is appointed must meet um, one of several criteria, including um, possessing a valid certificate issued by the State Board of Accountancy for, um, as a CPA, a Certified Public Accountant, possesses a baccalaureate degree from an accredited university or four-year institution, institution with a major in accounting or its equivalent, must have served within the last five years as a senior fiscal management position in a Fiscal, senior fiscal management position in a county, city, or private nonprofit, and that it has been a continuous period of not less than three years. Further criteria include that the person may possess a certificate issued by the Institute of Internal Auditors showing this person to be a designated professional internal auditor. The person has served as a county auditor or deputy county auditor or chief assistant for a continuous period of not less than three years. Um, Mr. Andy Sisk, Andrew Sisk, is currently the assistant auditor controller for the County of Placer and has been serving in this capacity for over nine years. Prior to joining Placer County, Mr. Sisk worked at Macias Genie and O'Connell CPAs for over eight years and he has 22 years of accounting and auditing experience. Not only does he well meet the criteria as established under the Charter and the County Code, but he has performed ably, and ably in his position as the Assistant County Auditor. Staff is recommending today that the Board appoint uh, Mr. Sisk as the County Auditor Controller to serve the remainder of the term as vacated by um, Catherine Martinez. Um, should you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. If you need additional information with respect to the process, we'd be happy to answer those, or maybe Mr. LaBeouf would have some comments with regard to that process. Uh, I strongly uh, joined in the recommendation, and I think the process has been outlined. You have a choice to fill the vacancy on this recommendation or go down a different path. We've done it both ways over the years. Um, but uh, my office strongly endorses the recommendation. Mr. Ziss is an excellent auditor and I think would make a great uh, elected official. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, uh, as a member of the Placer County Audit Committee, I serve with uh, Supervisor Duran and I've worked with uh, Mr. Fisk uh, the last four years, I guess. And uh, I'm impressed with his ability to uh, I'll bring information forward to uh, present it clearly in a way that even I can understand it. And uh, uh, he's been an able uh, right-hand person for uh, Kathy Martinez and a job as a county auditor. So I would uh, strongly endorse his uh, recommendation. Supervisor Duran. I'm going to go ahead and um, ditto and not repeat what, <laughs> what Supervisor Holmes said. Um, being a detailed guy here, um, I, I just have one question, and I think Andy can answer this. With regards to item C, do you possess a certificate issued by the Institute of Internal Auditors? I didn't see that on. <laughs> so, so just A, B, and D. Yeah. <laughs> B and D. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I get it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other comments, questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll open this up to the public. Is there anyone from the public who would like to weigh in on this topic in any way, shape, or form? Thanks. 
Janine Windeshausen, Placer County Treasurer. I hadn't actually prepared mm -hmm. anything, but I have been hoping that this would be the, um, that the, the board would appoint Andy to fill out the term. Uh, I've worked with Andy over the last nine years. He is as competent as anybody that you will find for this position. Uh, he has demonstrated his dedication to public service, and I recommend him without any reservation to fill out the term that retiring Auditor Controller Kathy Martinez um, has left behind. I can answer any questions if you'd like. Supervisor Euler, your light is on. Oh, sorry. I'll turn back. Okay. Um, Mr. Sisk, would you like to come forward and say anything to the board and the adoring masses of the public? <laughs> Good morning, Chairwoman Montgomery, members of the Board of Supervisors. First, I want to thank Holly and the members of the board for giving me this tremendous opportunity and for showing the confidence in my abilities to complete Kathy's term in office. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be the county's auditor controller, and I look forward to serving the citizens of Placer County in that capacity. I'm also truly blessed to have what I believe are some of the most talented employees working for me, and I look forward to leading them through new Gasbys and hopefully and hopefully not more things coming from the state legislature, but I, I doubt, I'm sure there'll be more coming. In closing, I want to thank uh, two women in my life who've made this day possible. First, to our prior auditor controller, Kathy Martinez. Wow, what an amazing person. She has been an incredible mentor and friend, and I will eternally be grateful to her for making me the complete professional I am today. She has raised the level of professionalism in our office, and even though she has set the bar high, I plan to do my best to ensure I never slip below that bar. Why? One, because she will be watching. <laughs> but more importantly, to make her proud of what she has accomplished and what I plan to accomplish in the future. And last, to my beautiful wife, Gabrielle. She has never wavered in her support of my career endeavors, even pushing hers aside a few times as I develop the tools necessary to become a great CPA, auditor, and eventually public servant. Thank you for being my strongest supporter and best friend these past 22 years. Thank you again for the board for doing this for me today. Thank you, Andy. All right. What's the pleasure of the board? Supervisor Euler. Um, Kathy, when you announced uh, your retirement, uh, I alluded to the uh, rather notable job you have done as a department head working with your staff on succession planning and uh, Andy in front of us today um, is uh, people's exhibit a in in that work that you've done it's it's uh, uh, made for and will make for a seamless transition for our board and for the CEO's office and working with your office and so um, I just want to once again publicly acknowledge your work in that regard your diligence in that regard and, uh, and thank you for the, the time and effort that you put into uh, succession planning in your office. Um, my apologies, by the way, for missing your retirement uh, uh, function. My, fu my son's doctor's appointment went far longer than it should have, uh, otherwise I would have made it up here. And in spite of the fact that Supervisor Wygant offered me 20 bucks to nominate him, <laughs> <laughs> I will take this opportunity to move approval of the appointment of Andy Sisk uh, as the uh, replacement for Kathy Martinez in the Auditor Controller's office. Second. Uh, Supervisor Duran, your light is on. Yeah, I, I was just going to, to make another comment and, and just say that, you know, uh, part of what our responsibilities are in the Board of Supervisors is to provide the atmosphere for our departments to develop talent. And again, uh, echoing Supervisor Euler's comments about uh, how it's worked out in the auditor controller's office, that's exactly what our responsibility is. So I'm very uh, proud to, to um, again, acknowledge and, and, and assist with this uh, transfer of responsibilities. Supervisor Wygant, your light is on. Just briefly, thanks, Kathy. Congratulations, Andy. And Kirk, I want my 20 bucks back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I just, before we vote on this, I want to echo all the words today. Um, Kathy, you did an amazing job, and you did an amazing job raising Andy. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to working 
uh, with Mr. Sisk as we worked so well together over the last couple of years and um, really also deeply appreciate the bench that you created within the auditor's office and it's something we all strive for in the county just having that depth um, so that when people do make choices such as you did to leave the county employment we have great people ready to step in so we have a uh, motion from Supervisor Euler and I believe a second from Supervisor Holmes um, all those in favor aye. aye any opposed any abstentions motion carries congratulations aye. Mr. Sisk We will move to our 10 o'clock timed item, which is uh, County Executive Emergency Services, Rui Cunha presenting on a Community Facilities District proposal for the Sunset Industrial Area. I'm sorry, Rui Cunha and Chief Brad Harris, also known as the Placer County Fire Warden. I think I got your title right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Rui Cunha, Assistant Director of Emergency Services for Placer County. Uh, the item uh, in front of you asks that your board approve a resolution of intention to form a Community Facilities District number 2012-1, Sunset Industrial Area Services, to fund fire protection and emergency medical services within the Sunset Industrial Area. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the map that's before you shows um, uh, the proposed boundaries for the district um, uh, once approved by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the boundary for the uh, CFD number 2012-1 would be contiguous with the current Sunset Industrial Area uh, boundary. Um, and that will be a future annexation area for any property or any project that comes forward uh, within that area um, in the future. The, um, the area that sh that's shown as coming out is the specific project that would form the nucleus of the base community facilities district. Um, and that is a project that is uh, uh, is currently pending uh, within land development. Uh, it is the Magnus Pacific project. It is a four parcel project uh, and it would in fact be the, f the first component of the community facilities district. Today your action is simply to approve a resolution of intention uh, and that resolution of intention uh, fundamentally notices the public um, and certainly the property owners within this area uh, of your intent to form uh, this community facilities district. Placer County is, has recognized over a number of years the need for fire service within the Sunset Industrial Area given the type of development uh, that was anticipated uh, within the SIA. Um, a number of studies were completed in the early 80s and uh, uh, that led to those conclusions and, and essentially uh, determined what an appropriate firefighting force might be uh, within that area. Uh, in 1997, uh, the Board of Supervisors approved the Sunset Industrial Area Plan, establishing goals, policies, and implementation that called for an equitable funding mechanism for fire service within the Sunset Industrial Area. Uh, in 2003, uh, the United Auburn Indian Community uh, in conjunction with opening uh, the, uh, the casino uh, within the Sunset Industrial Area, did in fact bring fire service into the SIA for the very first time. Um, they further expanded that fire service capability by adding a ladder truck with their expansion, adding the hotel uh, um, in 2009. We now have in the Sunset Industrial Area as, as a result of the United Auburn Indian Community's um, uh, commitment, we now have a, a, uh, a firefighting uh, force within the Sunset Industrial Area that provides a very high level of service uh, for that entire community. Um, however, 
Today, as we speak, the only ones paying for it are Placer County and, and, um, and the tribe. And realistically, that is, is contrary to what the, the board's intentions have been from the very beginning. Uh, and this community facilities district is intended over time to correct that, uh, that condition. Um, currently, the service consists of, uh, under contract with CAL FIRE, consists of seven firefighters on duty 24-7 um, during the winter months uh, uh, and non-fire season. And during fire season, we add two additional firefighters for a total of nine firefighters that are on duty 24-7 during, the, during uh, fire season. We are staffing a, a ladder truck as well as a, a Type 1 engine uh, and a brush engine, um, considering the full scope of, uh, of the hazards that exist within the Sunset Industrial Area and are projected to exist into the future. In 2010, the board unanimously uh, amended the Sunset Industrial Area Plan. And in that amendment, uh, what the board did was the board, um, uh, one, accounted for the existing uh, services and, and accounted for the fact that we now had uh, fire service within the area, but then also established a community facilities district as an appropriate funding uh, mechanism into the future uh, to assist in meeting the goals, policies, and implementation that were established uh, both in 97 and then reaffirmed in 2010. <clears throat> the total cost of uh, fire service within uh, the Sunset Industrial Area is just under $3.7 million, um, and, and that is an annual cost. Uh, we believe that we have, at least staff believes that we have brought forward or are bringing forward to the community um, uh, an equitable uh, apportionment of those costs, uh, not only for the Sunset Industrial Area and the tribe, but then also for uh, other future development that we believe um, will, will exist uh, adjacent to the uh, Sunset Industrial Area in the future. Uh, and through that apportionment, through that cost apportionment, we believe that we're bringing forward as most cost-effective fire service as possible uh, for uh, that very, very important area uh, for Placer County. The, after the apportionment um, is complete, the Greater Sunset Industrial Area uh, is um, uh, apportioned uh, a cost of about $1.9 million. And that apportionment, um, uh, it, once you remove the base property tax that's expected in the future, ultimately results in a, a requirement to, to raise $1.6 million in, in total revenues through this community facilities district into the future. That $1.6 million is attributed not only to future development, but to existing development. And that's important for the board to understand. There isn't any way in a community facilities district for services to ultimately recoup or have um, current development uh, annex into um, uh, the community facilities district unless they volunteer. Uh, and, uh, and, and we'll certainly ask. Um, but if they choose not to volunteer to, to um, uh, annex into the community facilities district, we will have a net deficit uh, within uh, the Sunset Industrial Area going forward as, as far as we can, can tell. Um, but in general, what we believe is we believe very strongly that uh, this community facilities district will in fact, and, and the charges that have been laid out in the engineering report, will in fact come very close to meeting the needs uh, that are laid out uh, for fire service um, uh, going forward. We've uh, accomplished a number of tasks to get here. Um, the, the, obviously, we've completed engineering reports. Uh, we've, we've conducted a number of community meetings. We've, we've spoken to um, uh, property owners. We've done direct mailings uh, to inform property owners of what we're doing out here. Um, most recently, uh, we did uh, have an opportunity to present this to the Bond Screening Committee, and the Bond Screening Committee uh, unanimously uh, approve this uh, going forward to the board um, uh, and for a recommendation. 
Um, we are now at the point of uh, asking your board to approve a resolution of intention. Um, following your board's action uh, and with a favorable action, we'll move forward with a, uh, a ballot and waiver initiative for the Magnus Pacific project specifically. And uh, uh, we'll finish up by coming back to your board on June 19th um, for a public hearing and uh, your board's um, uh, approval or, or we'll ask your board to consider the actual formation of the CFD at that time. Uh, subject to any questions that you might have, that com com concludes my formal presentation. Uh, Chief Harris, anything you'd like to add? Well, under the leadership of this board and the Tribal Council, we provide a very well-trained, very well-staffed fire protection system in the Sunset Industrial Area. Before you, we're, we have our plan to more equitably distribute it amongst the end users in that general area. I'm confident, uh, given the staffing that we have, the equipment we have, and the, and the training that we have, uh, have provided our, our uh, firefighters in, in that station, that we can handle any emergency that uh, comes up. And it's a very complex area. Uh, it contains probably the tallest building in Placer County, one, one of the very few high rises that exist in, in Placer County, uh, which is a motel, which is always a complex fire and rescue uh, scenario for us in the event of a fire. But again, under the leadership of this board and under the leadership of the United Auburn Indian Community Tribal Council, we've been able to meet that need. And I'm very confident that if we do have an emergency in there, that we're able to uh, contain it very quickly. Thank you. Uh, Holly, your light is on. Supervisor Euler. Yes, um, when we met yesterday, I asked you the question about the, uh, the residents that might be built uh, in this area and the fee that would be imposed associated with that. Do we have an answer on that question? Right, and um, <clears throat> for a property owner who owns uh, a parcel, whatever that size of that parcel is, uh, the drawing of, um, uh, of a building permit is a ministerial action that would not be subject to um, conditioning under this community facilities district. Um, the only way that we would, in fact, bring residential into, and, and the, the study does account for some residential development within the Sunset Industrial Area. The only way that that will occur is if, in fact, any given parcel owner chooses to do um, uh, some sort of development within their parcel, they've got to bring forward a map and, and as a result that development would be conditioned. Uh, but for a single property owner who wants to build a home and draw a building permit, um, there will, we, we do not have the ability under the ministerial um, uh, conditions associated with drawing a building permit to condition that single property owner to annex into the CFP. Okay, so, and just my, my question yesterday was along the lines of what, what triggers an annexation into the district or requires uh, that this fee start, start being collected. And the example that I gave was I own an ADA parcel, it's in the Sunset Industrial Area, I want to build a house on it. Uh, based on our formula, which is the greater of either the cost per square foot or the cost per acre, um, you know, an 80 acre parcel is going to trigger a $56,000 a year fire fee if I all of a sudden get hit with it. Um, so to be clear, what my, what my concern is those activities that would um, go on under individual owner occupant, knowing that a large part of the Sunset Industrial Area is agriculturally zoned. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, my agricultural equipment that I house in a barn. I work on it. I do those things. Nothing like that yeah. triggers this kind of a fee. That is when, correct. When you say it's only development, what I hear when I say, when I hear somebody say it's only development means it's the processing of a map that requires That's additional correct. entitlements beyond what rides with the zoning on the property. That's correct. Okay. We'll just hate to find ourselves in a position where somebody comes in and says, I want $56,000 a year for my house. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Supervisor Wigand. 
Supervisor Holmes. Oh, I just wanted to make sure that we thank the United Auburn uh, uh, Indian Community and the Thunder Valley Casino Resort uh, for their participation in uh, providing fire protection service uh, in the Sunset Industrial Air Area, and particularly the casino. Thank you. Any members of the public want to comment or ask any questions on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Chief Harris, don't go anywhere. You are up next with uh, our departmental item number nine, update on the 2012 fire season and fire prevention on BOR lands. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the, uh, the board. Yesterday, Governor Brown and uh, Director Ken Pimlock kicked off the annual Wildland Fire Awareness Week. So I'd like to take this opportunity to update you on where we are locally uh, with our potential fire season with the things that uh, we've got going on. Uh, this will be my 35th consecutive fire season. Uh, to say that it's going to be the worst one in history has kind of lost flavor over the years. So <laughs> what, I, what I would really like to do is tell you exactly what's going on out there and what my concerns are with the upcoming fire season. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the history of our weather. Uh, for the last three years, we've seen relatively mild fire seasons. We've seen very wet winters. Uh, last year, particularly, we saw a very wet winter, very long winter with low snowfalls. What that did for us was cause a great deal of snow kill. Uh, as the heavy snows came down, temperatures started to warm, trees and brush were shearing off which didn't really affect us all that much last year because we also had a very mild summer. But those fuels stayed out there. So right now between the elevations of 1,500 feet and 4,500 feet, we have a good deal of dead and down material that has been sitting there for a year drying. This last winter was a very dry winter for us. Uh, up until uh, February of this year, we, we saw very little rainfall. And when we did get our rainfall, we got it in uh, in, in torrents. So it didn't really soak into the ground, but we did, uh, we did get some rainfall. As a result, this year going into the, some of the things that I look at as a uh, fire control officer going into the, the fire season, our snowpack is at 55%. When I looked at the crop report recently for the uh, amount of hay and feed that's available for livestock out there, even with the torrential rains that we saw in March, and a little bit into April, the grasses are only at 50%. So farmers are gonna to have to buy hay. What that tells me as a firefighter is that uh, those fuels are very light, very sparse, and when they dry, when they cure, they were going to have very fast, very, very quickly moving fires because of the way that the fuels are spaced out there right now. So the potential for us to, to have fires is going to be there. It's going to be dependent upon weather. Uh, the other factor that I, I'm always concerned about is our ability to respond. Uh, we, because of budgetary constraints over the last several years, uh, our ability to respond has been reduced by about 20%. Local government has seen a reduction in their forces due to due budgetary uh, cuts by at least that amount, which means that there's that, uh, that, fewer, that many fewer pieces of apparatus available for us to respond. So as we go into this fire season, my concern is the abundance of fuel that we have out there and the uh, reduction in response resources that we have available to us. Uh, so something we'll be keeping our eye on. And I can tell you how fire season went uh, and how bad it was in, in uh, about six months from now. But for me to try and predict what it is going to be, I, I think we've all seen that before and, and it doesn't really work. Uh, but we do have the potential out there uh, there are some factors that are lining up against us. We're going to keep an eye on it. Uh, what we're going to ask of our, our constitu constituents and our citizens is that uh, they help us out. And the best way that they can help us out is provide us with that defensible space that, uh, that we need in order for our firefighters to, to get in there and safely defend their properties. They're the first line of defense. Uh, the fire departments and CAL FIRE are the second line of defense. We're the ones they can get in there and uh, do some effective work providing that the homeowner has given us that buffer so that we can, can make that happen. And uh, we're hoping that we have a successful fire season this year, uh, but I will be keeping uh, the board 
updated as the fire season goes along and any uh, any fires that occur within your district uh, I hope to see you out there and we'll uh, we'll uh, do the uh, drive around the fire and explain what's going on uh, supervisor Wygant survived one of those with me already so uh, it can be an exciting time um, as far as the Bureau of Reclama or Reclamation one of my highest areas of concern in the Nevada Yuba Placer unit is the canyons, uh, particularly the American River Canyon. In 2008, we ended a 30-year contract with the Bureau of Reclamation. Bureau of Reclamation withdrew from the contract. Uh, that contract gave us the ability to uh, fund fire suppression coming out of the, uh, or for fires that occurred within the canyon, but it also gave us the ability to do fuels reduction in the, in the canyon itself. 2008, when the contract ended, uh, it left us with the huge hole in those two areas. First of all, how do we prevent fires? How do we do fuel reduction? But um, how do we fund fires or, or pay for local government's response into those areas uh, when fires do occur? Uh, we quickly developed a system that allowed us to, to uh, fund uh, the, the fires that occurred in that. CAL FIRE took the lead. We actually fronted the money for any fires that occurred there and then billed BOR and they paid for the fires that occurred. So that system was in place. But the, the hole that we had and, and probably the most important hole that we had was our inability to do fuels reduction in the canyon itself. Um, supervisors Montgomery and, and, and Holmes have been uh, working tire, tirelessly with the Bureau of Reclamation to to help uh, bring forward a solution to that problem, along with a relative of Supervisor Holmes, uh, Councilman Mike Holmes uh, from the city of Auburn. So uh, we've been working very hard to come up with a solution to our problem. Uh, up until recently, it didn't seem like the solution was in the offing. Uh, just no way for us to have the ability uh, to go in and do fuels reduction in the canyon itself. Uh, we've recently had a turnaround in events uh, uh, due to, to some pressures that have been applied by this board and by, uh, by the legislature and both uh, federal and state government. And we are now working towards a contract that will allow us to act as labor for the Bureau of Reclamation on projects that they deem fit that they, uh, they wish to accomplish in there. So a huge step forward for us. We look forward to the completion of that contract and having the ability to do the fuels reduction to provide further fire safety for the communities that uh, live along the rim of the canyon there. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think this is an appropriate time to uh, give a uh, shout out for the Measure D in the North Auburn Oper fire. Uh, what you just said is, uh, you know, the resources are diminishing and we need to uh, have these residents step up to uh, provide a level of service, uh, particularly for North Auburn, which uh, Station 80 on Atwood Road is the most, bus the busiest fire station in the unincorporated area of Placer County. Uh, we don't have to look back too far to see what can happen if, uh, you know, the 49 fire, uh, August of 2009, uh, certainly uh, sent home that, that, that message to us. So hopefully those of those that were out there listening to this uh, will take that into consideration and support uh, Measure D on their ballot in June. Thank you. Uh, I see no other comments or questions from the board. Let me, let me just echo Supervisor Holmes' words um, and also just reiterate how important this is to rim communities particularly colfax forest hill and certainly the city of auburn um, we've had great partnerships working with members of the city of auburn uh, both their city council members and also the fire safe councils um, in putting that pressure on our state and federal partners and um, chief harris you've been instrumental in that as well and i, I really want to thank you because this is a absolutely critical issue for all the rim communities um, and uh, just please keep us posted on the progress of those talks. I, I hope the next conversation we have is, Jennifer, we have a signed contract. Uh, so I, I look forward to that. I think it's very close. But uh, again, I cannot thank uh, both yourself and Supervisor Holmes for the work you did. Without your help, without uh, the help of uh, Councilman Holmes in the city of Auburn, I don't think we would have been nearly as successful as we are right now. 
Thank you, and I think that will really accrue to the benefit ultimately of Colfax, Forest Hill, Auburn, and the North Auburn community as well. All right, we don't need to take any action on this, so um, unless there's any members of the audience who would like to comment or ask any questions on this item, we'll move on to our next item. All right, thank you very much. Let's move on to item 10, departmental item 10, facility services, Western Placer Regional Sewer Project. Bill Zimmerman presenting. Resolution authorizing the chair to sign an advance payment agreement with the city of Lincoln that will provide up to a million dollars in funding for Lincoln to proceed with the design and environmental work associated uh, with the Lincoln offer for the regional sewer project. We're also asking you to approve a budget revision transferring four million dollars in appropriations from the SMD1 upgrade project capital project budget to the SMD1 Regional Sewer Capital Project budget, and that'll provide funding for uh, expenditures related to the Midwestern Placer Regional Sewer Project. Back in March, your board elected to move forward with the City of Lincoln's offer to complete the Regional Sewer Project uh, and directed staff to negotiate an agreement for the design and environmental review of that project. We're actively negotiating and drafting that agreement and we anticipate having that back to your board for consideration in June. As you're aware, we have some very tight timelines associated with the project, both in terms of overall completion and our, our permit compliance dates, as well as some shorter term um, timelines associated with being able to transfer the SRF funding from the upgrade project to the regional project. And so as an initial step to allow that design and environmental work to proceed uh, while we negotiate the, the design and environmental review agreement, our department reallocated about $300,000 from an agreement with ICF Jones and Stokes to start that work. And we estimate that that funding will take us through early May, which is about now. In order to allow that work to continue until we bring the design and environmental review agreement back to your board for consideration, we have developed the advanced payment agreement that we have before you this morning. And a couple of points that I would like to make, a uh, couple of things I'd like to point out about the agreement is that it's only associated with work included in Lincoln's offer for the regional sewer project and that we will be tracking those costs and as we negotiate the design and environmental review agreement, we'll be negotiating a credit back for those costs in that agreement. And so with that as background, we're asking your board this morning to uh, adopt the resolution included in our staff report and also to approve the budget revision included in our staff report. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Supervisor Holmes. Uh, Bill, the uh, $4 million that we're advancing, is that going to be uh, going to Lincoln in whole, or is that going to be, we're going to pay for the, the uh, work as it goes along? The advance payment agreement is for $1 million. The $4 million in the budget revision is to fund that work plus additional work that will come through the design and environmental review agreement. We will, Lincoln will invoice us for that work based on work they've completed, so it'll be kind of a pay-as-you-go process, not an upfront lump sum payment to Lincoln. Okay, great. Uh, just so the board is aware, uh, I've had my office has had several phone calls from people in the Ulper area. Uh, last week, I was standing in the living room with uh, several uh, residents out there that wanted to know what the heck was going on, where, where is this pipeline going to go, and uh, I tried to answer their questions as best I could. I know Bill is going to be, or uh, Bruce is going to be uh, presenting to the North Auburn MAC tonight. Uh, he'll be at the uh, Newcastle Oper MAC. But uh, the citizens out there have also requested a community meeting, uh, which will be held May the 14th out at the Oper Fire Station uh, to answer any questions and to kind of give an explanation of what's going on. So my office has been uh, filled with uh, requests from many people that live in that area about uh, how this is going to roll out. So it's very important. I know this, we all know that this wasn't a unanimous decision on the Board of Supervisors, 
but uh, we need to make sure that this thing moves forward in a clear and direct way. And uh, that's, that's what I want to see happen. So. And we're happy to participate that and give you whatever support we can. Thank you. Supervisor Duran? Yes. Um, question uh, you had kind of mentioned very briefly about oversight. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about, obviously, are costs of the project. And uh, within this design and uh, environmental review agreement, is there any type of an oversight committee contemplated uh, to kind of oversee, uh, not, not necessarily the environmental review process, but mm -hmm. post that when we start getting into a more uh, construction phase or pre-construction phase? Um, some type of a committee uh, comprised of some folks that can oversee and review value engineering considerations and those kinds of things as we move forward. Right now we are meeting weekly as a project coordination team to oversee the design, to oversee the environmental um, and the more technical aspects of the project. Um, I think probably the best way for me to, and we'll continue to do that as we work through the project. Um, we've also, your board approved this morning on the consent agenda, contracts for an engineering firm and an environmental firm to help us with that, for that oversight. Um, but I think the best way for me to answer your question is that the way the agreement will be structured is that Lincoln will provide us a, at one point it was called a firm cost, we've kind of backed off that a little bit. But there will be, we will have a set cost for the design and the environmental piece of it, and then we will negotiate a set cost for the construction piece of the project. And, you know, certainly if something changes, there will be contingencies built into that project that will be able to account for that. And so I, I think moving forward, at least at this point in the structure of the agreement, I'm pretty comfortable that those assurances or the, that oversight is there. Okay. Uh, County Council? Yeah, uh, Supervisor Duran, following up on your comments, I'd like to remind the board that when this matter was approved, I indicated in a small portion of the memo that the County Council's office would be coming forward with additional requests for assistance and. I plan on the 22nd of May to bring forward an item for outside counsel. Uh, what we've done is structured this sort of to keep up. Uh, facility service started out of the gate in January, February, funding money from existing funds. Uh, the agreement for you is sort of to keep that process moving forward. Uh, the next agreement, the design environmental review, is to not waste a year of contract negotiation time why we need to move forward on the project. But ultimately, there's going to be a long series of agreements which will have those kind of assurances, I think, built into them. And frankly, one of the reasons we'll be bringing forward the contracts on the 22nd is uh, because of staffing problems in the county council's office created by vacancies or soon to be vacancies. We just can't keep up with the workload right now. And uh, But I think those have always been in our mind as issues and I don't think Lincoln's ever disagreed. Uh, that's been on Lincoln's proposals from the beginning, too, is that there need to be a, a clearinghouse to solve these issues. So. Thanks. Holly? Um, yes, if I might add here, um, in reference to your question, Supervisor Duran, just so you know, basically the county executive office, along with facility services and our members from the board on the Regional Sewer Committee have continued to meet along with staff and we've really organized into teams in terms of engineering, financial, and legal issues. That group has been meeting every two, two to three weeks, I would say, and will continue to do so to monitor, monitor the progress in each of those areas and provide some coordination and reporting to our board members. Part of that group is a financial team that also will be looking at um, how, not only the financing in terms of the long run with the city of Auburn and Lincoln and, and our own SMD1, but um, monitoring how those expenditures are made within the firm price agreement. So it's an ongoing um, structure that we've adopted really to provide this overall coordination in these four to five disciplines. So we will also be keeping your board apprised of um, progress on each of those 
doing interim progress reports. The city of Lincoln has provided that and agreed to continue to provide those. So we're refining those as we speak and we'll keep you informed as those things progress. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, uh, Supervisor Duran, I just want to assure you that uh, there will be a citizens committee uh, overlooking this project, particularly the people that live in the area where the pipeline is proposed to go. And uh, that was pretty direct uh, from when my meeting last week with them. And I'm sure that there'll be more uh, coming forward on May the 13th when uh, we meet uh, out at the Oprah Fire Station. I would um, actually like to echo Supervisor Holmes' words. I, I was at an Eagle Scout um, Court of Honor ceremony and had a number of people come out to me and say, hey, I'm really concerned about this route. There was some guy wandering around my property telling me that the pipeline's going to be going through it, potentially. Um, and uh, it's very high on people's radar. So we need to make sure that it's not just the max, that, that these discussions are held, but very open, very robust public communications continue. Um, there's a very high level of what I would term angst about where the pipeline route may or may not end up. Um, and while that's not specific to this item today, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that's going to be very high on my radar as well, that we make sure we do that outreach to folks both from the city and from the county side of this equation. Um, while we're on this general topic, I'd also like to um, ask that at some point in the reasonably near future, we get a report back to our board as to where the discussions stand with the city of Auburn um, and their level of participation in this project or not. I just think we should be kept updated on a fairly routine basis on those discussions so that nothing takes us by surprise. Those are my comments on this. Is there anyone in the audience um, who would like to comment or ask any questions on this. Bruce, was there anything you wanted to add? Bruce Barnworth, City of Lincoln. Uh, maybe I could just add a little bit. We, we mirror the concern about working with property owners and we've gone out there. I've gone out there personally and talked to more than 30 property owners. In some cases, there are some loose ends where we've talked to them once, we need to go back and talk to them again and we will be doing that. We've also sent out uh, letters after getting review from the city of, Lincoln, uh, city of Auburn and from the county to 22,000 people uh, in that area, covered basically 3,000 feet from any proposed pipeline, just to make sure that we've covered everybody. We've gotten back some response from that. Uh, it's been fairly limited. About uh, eight people, I think, have called or sent email messages back in. But we see the, the, uh, the public and the community as being partners in this project, just as the county and the city of Auburn hopefully will be. And uh, so if you have any questions or any concerns, feel free to give me a call and I'd be glad to address those. While I have you then, the one very specific concern that two different constituents raised, um, and they asked me to pass them along to the city because you'll be ultimately putting the contracts together for the um, construction companies moving forward, is some sort of bonding for broken windshields. There's a great deal of concern, apparently, about uh, construction traffic kicking up gravel and rocks on the roads, in the, in the rural road areas that this pipeline will be moving forward. And there was a request that some sort of bond be um, imposed upon the construction companies to cover that potential damage. I've now done my duty and passed that along to you, and um, I'm sure we can talk about that in the future. Uh, Supervisor Holmes. Oh, I just wanted to make a point about the uh, public outreach. Uh, uh, our PIO office has worked with uh, my aide, Ruth Alves, and I believe Jocelyn uh, Maddox, your aide, uh, to make sure that the public outreach is uh, um, detailed and uh, as accurate as can be possible. Can be. Absolutely. We'll just have to continue to work together on that. Supervisor Euler. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, the public outreach component is important. I, I think it's safe to say, and it would be important for us to begin reinforcing right now, that given the rather tight time constraints under which this project will be operating, um, there's a difference between public outreach and negotiation. Uh, when it is determined what the pipeline uh, alignment needs to be, uh, we're going to have to act and we're going to have to act rapidly to secure the right-of-way for that, uh, that pipeline and 
there's not going to be a lot of negotiation. We simply don't have the time if we're going to bring this project in um, and and you know, meet our uh, our requirements under uh, under what's negotiated with our uh, our permits. So. While, yes, it's important to keep folks informed that this project is moving forward, it's also important to uh, properly set expectations early on that there's not a whole lot of room to maneuver in this project. Thank you for reinforcing that. I think that's a, a, a valuable thing for the community to hear as well as our board. If I could make one point regarding that, and that it, it's very important to understand that the project as the City of Lincoln proposed can be 100 percent within public roads. That is our fallback. We can have the pipeline be completely within public roads and not go across private property. We are trying to mutually arrive at something that is acceptable to the project and acceptable to the property owner if we can find um, and we're looking at alternative routes that would be shorter and less costly and in some cases better environmentally uh, and also provide some payment to the property owners. If that can be provided and done in a way that's mutually beneficial, then we'll move that way. If not, we'll keep the pipeline in the road right away. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes. So any uh, payment to property owners that comes out of the firm price? Yes. Any members of the public want to comment on this? All right, seeing none, I'll bring this back to the board. Um, this is a roll call, and what's the uh, pleasure of the board? Wycant? Yes. Duran? Yes. Holmes? No. Euler? No. Montgomery? Yes. All right, at this point, we will move on to our 1030 timed item. Uh, Sheriff's Department, Janice Gage presenting. Good morning, Chair Montgomery, members of the board, Janice Gage with the Placer County Sheriff's Office, and also with me this morning, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Daryl Steinauer, Court Security Lieutenant, and Jake Chatters, who is the Placer County Superior Court Administrator. This is our annual request to your board for approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Sheriff's Office and the Placer County Superior Court. It is a two-year memorandum, July 1st, 2011 through June 30th, 2013. Total funding for both years is $3,812,705. The funds are derived from the 2011 uh, Budget Act realignment funding. And since 1999, our office has maintained a memorandum of understanding with the courts to provide court security services. Our staff confers with the court administrator and his staff on a monthly basis. And through these ongoing discussions in a comprehensive mid-year review of security services, we are able to arrive at this overarching agreement and understandings that are developed and folded into a comprehensive MOU. Statute precludes a pass-through of certain charges such as administration fees, overhead, and some of our staff training retiree benefits. Those costs are covered within our Sheriff's Office budget. Should additional funds become available, we're still waiting for the May revise, but should they become available, we will again confer with the court administrator and his staff to arrive at adjustments in this memorandum of understanding uh, services. With that, we do request your approval of this MOU, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and also uh, Lieutenant Steinauer and um, Jake Chatters are here to answer your questions as well. Okay. Thank you, Janice. Any questions from the board? I see none. Anyone in the audience want to comment or ask any questions on this item? Is there anything that either of you gentlemen wanted to add to this? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we will move on to departmental item 11, public works. 
Caltrans Cooperative Agreement, Alpine Meadow Road, Alpine Meadows Road and State Route 89. Um, you are not Peter Kratz. I'm not. I'm Matt Randall, okay. a senior engineer Thank with the Matt. Public Works Department, Chairman Montgomery, board members. Good morning. Uh, yes, this morning we're asking you to adopt a resolution authorizing our director to enter into and execute a co-op agreement with Caltrans with County Council uh, review and approval. And with this agreement, we would receive the county would receive $874,000 for construction improvements of the intersection of Alpine Meadows Road and State Route 89. And just a, <clears throat> a couple of highlights with this, this item. Uh, the funding depends on bid savings uh, that the state will realize from their current projects. And so the funding has actually come from the state shop, uh, their maintenance program. And this funding, because it's state funding, requires CTC approval after the bid savings at either the May or June meeting. And so what this agreement will do is allow us, allow the state to fund these intersection improvements, which includes some turning lanes and paving and the signal at Alpine Meadows Road, and uh, which will, part of those improvements will be required as part of the bridge project, uh, getting our encroachment permit. So the intention of this is to build all these improvements with our bridge replacement project. So with that, just open it up to questions. Any questions on this item from the board? Supervisor Duran. Yeah, um, how long is it gonna take you to get that encroachment permit? What's the timetable? The timetable is that we're expecting it before we finish our plans and specifications and all of our bid package before next year. Okay. So um, we're actually, we've started the process with them and they've reviewed some of our preliminary plans and that's where some of the estimate comes, comes from, so. Uh, yeah, so before we go to construction, either in 2014 or next year. Matt, on this project, and um, this is con in conjunction with the bridge project, right. as you mentioned, and, and the bridge is going to be slightly realigned, is that correct? Yeah, it's slightly. It's pretty much centered on the existing alignment, so yeah. There, there is a little bit of local concern about adding an additional stoplight. Uh, on right. Highway 89, did, did, were alternatives looked at for the intersections, such as roundabouts yeah. or something along? Yeah, we did. We looked at some other alternatives, and a, and actually we um, we discussed it at the the HOA meeting. We looked at a, a roundabout, and we looked at a signal, and we did a traffic study as well. And it turned out that the roundabout was going to be more costly than the intersection, and so that was part of the the reason why we went with a signal, which was already approved as part of the original um, uh, Caltrans project report. And uh, we did actually uh, reach out at the, the North Tahoe, the NITRAC too as well. And so, you know, we didn't hear any concern there, but, I, but that doesn't mean that there, there aren't some concerns because I know that Tahoe roundabouts are a popular thing. Um, but I think ultimately it came down to an issue of construction money and was the money available and this is, the signal was more fundable. Does that answer your question? It's it does, and, and where the concern was generated, frankly, is the fact that that's a known avalanche zone right there, and the concern is if traffic is stopped at a light, there's a, the, the, the feeling um, yeah. is that there's a higher risk for, for people in vehicles to potentially be trapped, hmm. um, whereas if traffic is continuing to move through a roundabout, um, right. That might partially be offset. I am not a traffic engineer. I can't tell you if one increases a, a risk of being trapped in an avalanche or not. But did we look at the avalanche risk for that area, or did Caltrans? Well, I, yeah, I can I can be sure. Do you want to do you want to help with this one? Do you want me yeah, to go I'll first, or you? This. Yeah, and I have an answer too. But yeah, sorry to throw a wrench in the work. No, no, it's oh, just a good question. Uh, the, the official avalanche roll or corridors are a little bit further up the road. Part of the process is there's really only a few days out of the year where there's a big issue. It's letting out off the ski hill mm -hmm. uh, is the big one coming off the hill. Otherwise, there's not a problem whatsoever. Uh, the roundabout had some real positives in that regard, uh, but in general, it was much more expensive, very large footprint to accommodate the speeds on Highway 89 and with uh, the river right behind it was environmentally very challenging to consider that and not to mention the costliness of it. Uh, we feel very comfortable there won't be any problem in an emergency. People are going to be able to get down. Not any worse than what they are today yeah. with no signal at all. Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions from the board? 
Any member of the audience want to comment on this? <laughs> All right, I'll bring it back to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. We'll move on to 11B, Cook Riola Bridge. Cook Riola Road Bridge Replacement Project, Ken Grimm presenting. Ken Grimm again with the Department of Public Works. Today we're asking you to adopt a resolution uh, approving uh, a contract with Somas Inc. of Roseville for the construction management, inspection, material testing, and related services for the, uh, the Cook Riolo Bridge Replacement Project in an amount of $850,029. In addition to that, we're asking you to authorize the Director of Public Works to enter into future contract change orders up to an amount of $100,000. The reason we're asking that's actually a little bit more than what we usually ask for. The reason for that is this project we hope and intend to get done in two construction seasons. But because of the complexity of it, depending on the weather, particularly during the winters and how much we get done before the winter, how much we get down through the, or how much we can get done through the winter, uh, it could go into a third season. We want to be able to have that ability. If it does, it's it's going to be because of the contractor's operations. But we are proposing to replace the existing bridge on, on Cook Riolo Road. Uh, the county issued an RFP for these services. We got, what, quite a few uh, uh, proposals, but Somis of Roseville was the number one rated firm. Uh, it's important to note your board approved the construction contract for the Cook Riolo Bridge at your last meeting to MCM Construction. So between that contract and this contract, we are ready to get started on the work. In fact, there are utility companies for the last several weeks that have been out there already relocating their facilities, getting everything prepped for us to be able to get out there probably next month, early June. And so with that, we're asking you to uh, approve the contract with SOMAS, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, uh, Ken, just under fiscal impact, the uh, county uh, roads funds and P mitigation programs that the it's between 11.47 percent and 20 percent what generally it's yeah uh, well, uh, this project was started approximately close to 10 years ago uh, when the project was first started under the design it was reimbursed at the rate of 80 oh, percent we put in 20 the federal government put in 80 uh, since the right away and the construction they have improved the program. And now it is reimbursed at the rate of 88.53%. And so for the construction, including the construction contract and this contract, we will be reimbursed 88.53%. So it's a blended rate for the entire project over the span of several years. Okay, great, thank you. I see no other questions from the board. Any member of the audience like to comment on this? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. That will take us to 11C, Qualified List of Environmental Services Firms and Blanket Purchase Order Contracts for Environmental Services. Matt Randall presenting. That's me with Public Works. So uh, with this item, we're asking you to uh, adopt a, re a resolution approving a list of qualified firms and award blanket purchase order agreement uh, contracts to the top six rank firms for our public works projects in the county, and the maximum amount of $225,000 per contract, uh, not, to see to, not to exceed a total combined amount of $1,350,000. Uh, $1, and then uh, we're asking you to authorize the purchasing manager uh, to sign and execute these BPO contracts with risk management and county council approval, and to transfer funds between BPO contracts as needed. Um, so. Like the last item, uh, we did a solicitation with the Procurement Services Department for these environmental services, and we got a, a, very, a very good response. Um, 20, 20 something firms, 170 firms were notified, and uh, we got numerous responses. And then the panel ranked the top six firms, and just for your reference, they're in the, the package, but it's Sycamore, North State Resources, Dock and Engineering, LSA Associates. ICF International and PMC, and uh, and so this list um, is intended to replace the list that just expired in March uh, earlier of March this year, and these BPOs will be used for mostly for our federal aid bridge and roadway projects, um, and so that was part of the criteria in ranking the firms. So with that, just open it up to questions. 
I see no questions from the board. I, I will note that we had, um, it looks like seven Placer County firms um, applied and one made it into the top six. Is that correct? That sounds right, yeah. Okay. Uh, I see no questions from the board. I see no one in the audience who probably wants to comment at this point, so I'll bring it back to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, Ken. Um, at this time, we'll move to our final departmental item, which is County Council. Tony? The board will go into closed session and take up the items on page 4, item 12. There's one litigation matter, a discussion with uh, the board in labor negotiations for PPEO discussions and a continuing discussion with regards to the County Executive Officer recruitment. Uh, we will report back later. Thank you.